are watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Celestial greetings. I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. Today's topic is the lunar nodes, or what I chose to call our celestial directional indicators, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. And I have props today because my friend Donna from West Hartford says I need to illustrate things better, and she's right, of course. So I looked back to see if I had spoken with you about the nodes ever before. Do you know that I have a long list of my show topics? It goes back into the early 2000s. And the main one that I could find that we talked about the nodes before, and that's spelled N-O-D-E-S, nodes, was in April, I believe, of 2013. So it's been about four years, and I thought, oh, that bears bringing up the topic again, because it's a good topic, and it's a timely one, and you'll find out momentarily. Well, at that time, I had a guest with me, and this is her book on the moon's nodes. Her name is Agneta Borstein. Many people from West Hartford may know her because for years she ran a wonderful shop in downtown West Hartford called Agneta's Books and Things. And she, like me, is a professional astrologer. And this is actually a revision of a book she had done some years earlier, also called The Moon's Notes, had a different cover, and she kind of, uh, with the guidance of her publisher, restructured it a little bit to make it a, a bit more accessible to non-astrologers. And she has a subtitle here that'll be hard for you to see maybe. It's called Understanding the Dynamic Ties That Bind. And I'll tell you what that means. So, dynamic means in motion. That's about the main thing it means. We might sometimes think it means, oh, you know, very kind of enthusiastic or, you know, emoting or something. But dynamic actually means in motion, especially if you think of it from the sort of engineering type of terminology. And the ties that bind. So think about fasting, not the kind where you don't eat, hand fasting, what they would do for like pagan marital ceremonies. They literally bound the brides and grooms hands together for that day, so they had to stick together. So the lunar nodes are a factor in astrology that can show connections between people, and that's where Agneta got her title. So let's back up for a second and let me explain what the moon's nodes are. It sounds like they might be bumps on the lunar surface. Well, we always know there's craters and there's little mountains too, but this has nothing to do about the surface of the moon. It has to do with the interaction of two important orbits. You know, you remember from science, the Earth goes around the sun once a year. We orbit the sun. And while we're orbiting the sun, the moon is busy orbiting us. So there's two orbits going on. And if you think about this, the Earth-Sun orbit of one year is the definition of what a year is, a solar year. It's our seasons. And we come back to sort of the same point in the seasonal cycle after a year. The moon's orbit around the Earth is where we get our month. It takes that about a month for the moon to go from new moon to new moon. So if you think about these are two orbits 
and they're not on the same plane. So they're at an angle to each other, and that's where, Donna, I brought the illustration. These are two like workout circles, but I put them a little bit at an angle to one another, because let's pretend this is the orbit of the Earth around the Sun as a plane, okay? And let's pretend this is the orbit of the moon around the Earth. They're really not as inclined to one another. I, I heard it's like five degrees, but you know, it's hard to get these things to stick together anyway. But see, there's two points where these two orbits intersect. So if we said the moon spends half of each month, approximately, above the plane of the Earth-Sun orbit, and then it shifts and it goes below the plane of the Earth-Sun orbit. So it ascends and it descends. It goes north of and it goes south of. So this is called the north node or ascending node. And this is called the south node or descending node. There's nothing in the sky there. These are just projections of movement paths. But what is important, and here's a great word for you if you ever get the right letters in Scrabble, syzygy, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. I think I've talked to you about that before. Oh, one of my ex-boyfriends, it's one of his favorite words. But anyway, it's a cool word, syzygy. It basically means three things that are lined up in a plane, or three things that are aligned. So we know that when we have the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon all lined up, that's when we get eclipses. Now every month, the Earth, from our viewpoint, we see the Moon pass where the Sun is, and that gives us a new Moon. And when they're exactly across from each other and we're in the middle, that's when we get a full Moon. But they're not always eclipses, because they're not always with everything aligned perfectly in the syzygy for something to block something out. Either the moon blocks out the sun and we get a solar eclipse, or the Earth's shadow keeps any of the sun's light from hitting the moon and we have a lunar eclipse. So those only happen when the new moon or full moon are near these node intersections. They have to be within about 15 to 19 degrees on either side, one or both nodes, and then your full or new moon is an eclipse. So we have eclipses in pairs or sometimes a trio about six months apart when we get new moons or full moons near these north and south nodes of the moon. Now, I am not an expert in celestial mechanics to make it I'm not even sure I understand exactly why, but the degrees at which these intersections occur slowly work backwards over time against that backdrop that we measure everything against the zodiac. It's like our measuring stick or our racetrack. So their natural motion is what we would call retrograde or against the usual zodiac order. So in other words, we say, oh, Aries, first sign of spring, next sign Taurus, next sign Gemini. And that's how the sun goes through all those signs. Moon goes through the signs in that order. All the planets go through the signs in that order. Every once in a while, they do that optical illusion retrograde where they appear to backtrack and possibly go from one sign back to the prior one. Like right now, we have a Venus retrograde going on and Venus marched into Aries, looked like it stopped, marches back into Pisces, looks like it stops, marches forward again. We talked about that one in the March show of Looking Up, so you can review that if you want. But mostly the planets just move through the signs in that what we call zodiac order. But these nodes of the moon shift back over time in the opposite order. So instead of going from Aries to Taurus, goes from Aries to Pisces, from Pisces backward into Aquarius. And that's where we're getting ready to make that shift now. So the whole circuit around the zodiac is about 18 years, and that's about 18 months in each of the 12 signs for the North Node. The South Node is always exactly opposite the North by degree, by fraction of a degree, in the opposite sign. So they're like an axis, an arm, that always travels together. 
And when we see the signs change, there's going to be some difference in kind of where we feel like where we're coming from and where we're headed to. And that's why I call them the directional indicators. The south node, like if we're looking in your birth chart, we would say, this is what you brought into this lifetime with you. If you believe in reincarnation, we would say this is what you brought from your past lives or a key past life into this lifetime, something to kind of work on or work with. The north node is what you should be taking out of this lifetime as your takeaway. What did you learn and achieve in this incarnation? And I always like to remind people, be careful with your present life because your present life is the past life of your future life. So you better do it right. So if you do your north node right, you're going to achieve the learning that you came here to do on a spiritual growth level in this lifetime and take that as your progress point into your next life. So the south node is kind of been there, done that. What comes very easily, comfortable like an old shoe. Not a growth point. It's a trap. It can hold us back. It keeps us from going after that north node, which is the harder thing to do. It's almost like a magnetic repulsion. It's like, oh, do I have to do that? Yes, you do. Can't just stay comfortable with this south node? No, you have to go to that north node. So these are the symbols that we use in astrology for the nodes. You see two circles joined by something that's kind of like a rope. So in our glyphs, the circle is like a symbol for spirit. So we might say it's two spirits yoked. And actually, I do believe the word yoga comes from yoke. And the YG kind of sound in syzygy, uh, that also comes from an ancient Sanskrit yogi kind of word. Anyway, you might think of it, it looks almost like oh, those old little beetle cars. You know, the wheels are down. Or if you even think of like a ladybug beetle or something, if you put it on its back and the little feet or the wheels are in the air, it can't go anywhere. So your south node really can't take you where you want to go. You have to have wheels down north node to go where you're supposed to be going. But the idea is still here that it's a tie that binds two spirits. And that's sort of what Agneta was talking about with her book, The Moon's Nodes. Now I want to recommend another wonderful book to you. Plenty of fun. This is by an author named Michael Luton. He lives down in Manhattan, but he's a, from Hartford originally. He's been an astrologer for a long time. This book is called Sunshines, The Astrology of Being Happy. I think that's what it's called. Yes, it is. And Michael, for many years, was the astrologer for Vanity Fair magazine. So many people do know him from that. And this book works with your sun sign and your nodes, the signs of your nodes. And you don't have to know any astrology really to use it. What he says is, oh, like I'm a Libra. I go to the chapter on Libra. Then you look for your year. You say, well, I don't have to tell you what year I'm born. But I look up the year that I'm born, and it tells me read Libra 5 or read Libra 11. So you go and you read that part of Libra, and it is very right on to what's going on in your life, especially your relationship, karma life. And then it'll tell you in the back, you probably ought to look at a couple of other chapters. Well, those other chapters are going to be related to the sign of your north node and the sign of your sun sign. So for me, I had to look up things about love and about freedom. And sometimes it's hard to balance the two things that are these really strong issues for you because, you know, if you're deeply in love with somebody, you're kind of joined at the hip or you're yoked get together. And then how do you have your freedom? Um, but at any rate, he tells you with lots of humor, kind of what are your bugaboos and where you go south, what you tell yourself, your shrink, your guardian angel, but nobody else. You know, he's just got a funny way of looking at things. What are your key relationship issues? How to get your power back? Um, and near the end of each chapter, pathways to healing. You know, some key words for you to use along the way. So I recommend 
that even if you think you don't know any astrology, and even if you do know a lot of astrology, you could very much enjoy Michael, L-U-T-I-N, Michael Luton's book, Sunshines. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about where the nodes are now and where they've been for about the past 18 months and where they're going for about the next 18 months. Because at the end of April, they're changing signs. Now, there's one little nuance, and I really don't understand the celestial mechanics enough of this one, but you can just average out that slight backwards movement through the zodiac, or you can look at it as a little bit of a zigzag. So there could be sort of a backward step, a forward step, minute fractions of degrees at a time. But those are the measurements of the true node, which sometimes looks like it's going forward through the zodiac, sometimes backwards. I used to think, well, true node sounds like it should be true, and the mean node sounds like it should be mean. But Somebody who I respect a lot, who knows more about celestial mechanics than I do, told me he's a, comp a proponent of the mean or averaged node, which only goes backwards. So the point I want to make, the mean node is going to change signs on April 28th. And the true node, if that's the one you'd like to follow, it doesn't change signs to May 9th. Well, guess what? Those are less than two weeks apart. So out of 18 months, close enough for me. And where they have been, okay. The north node has been going through Virgo. North node says, what do we aim towards? Virgo, selfless service, humility, possibly mm, analysis, that can get on the critical or picky side, but it's mostly sort of a work orientation. And the south node has been going through Pisces. Pisces is a sign more about, it can be escapism, it can be mm, your belief system. So we might say, we've been learning how to not just take things on blind faith, the sort of trap side of Pisces, and learn how to analyze them and find the real facts and sift out sort of the wheat from the chaff. That's a very Virgo thing to do. And when they're going to shift to the signs earlier than that, we've got the North Node going into Leo and the South Node going into Aquarius. Well, let's talk about the South Node first. Aquarius is the sign of the masses, friends, groups, the circles you travel in. It's mm, it does have to do with individuality and uniqueness, but not in a, oh, it's all about me kind of way. Humanitarian. Now that's not necessarily a trap, but when the Leo North Node says, you're supposed to find your heart, your joy, your inner child, your creative impulses, and something about your way to shine and your leadership ability. You know, it's a, a regal sign. You know, think of like Leo, the lion, the king of the forest or the jungle. So we're all supposed to be finding our inner king or queen and having maybe more of a sense of autonomy. And if that is fed or substantiated by the Aquarius, your collective of your peeps, then that's great. If your peeps are holding you back from doing your shine, that's what's not good. So this is sort of what our challenge is coming up for us in the next year and a half. And as I mentioned, where these nodes are is where we have eclipses. So we have already actually started to have eclipses in the Leo Aquarius sign pair. And we have just had the final eclipse that we're going to have in the Pisces-Virgo pair. It was the February 26th new moon eclipse was at 8 degrees of Pisces. And usually you get about a year maybe with just your current node sign pairs as the eclipses. And then sometimes eclipses start coming in even from what will be the next sign pair, which after... Leo Aquarius, the nodes will move into Cancer and Capricorn. And that'll be a whole different ball of wax, but I don't think we're starting to have eclipses in that sign pair quite 
yet. Let me see. Whoops. We will. In 2018, in July, we will have an eclipse in Cancer. A new moon eclipse in Cancer. So yeah, we're only getting about a year of just pure Leo Aquarius before we start bringing in some of the next grouping. Well, it's nice. You get some overlap. Um, one of the things that I find very interesting is that in an individual's chart, this node axis, wherever it goes, it's going to be in a pair of what we call your houses, or they're like the departments of your life. So not only are the signs that you're born with them going to give you some clues about your celestial directional indicator, but those houses are going to tell you what departments of your life you need to be watching out not to get trapped in, or working hard to integrate and learn and practice whatever it preaches. Sometimes we'll have connections to one or the other ends of that node axis. So if you happen to have one of your natal planets near the north node, it helps draw you in the direction you're supposed to be growing. If you have a planet near one of your, near your natal south node, it is more likely to hold you back or let's say at least represents something that relates to your trap or maybe relates very much to a karma that you brought in from a past life that you're here to work on in this lifetime. Now, it's also possible, since this forms like an axis, that you can have something perpendicular to it and form like a T. And you've heard me talk about T squares and how they can mean trouble or tension and they bring a turning point. And actually there's a term for when a planet is halfway between the north and south node and they're said to be at the bendings. Now I wonder if that has to do because here is the bent portion halfway between those connections of the intersections, the earth, sun, and moon, earth intersections. But anyway, a bending. And the bendings are where we have our sort of push to shift the balance. You know, sometimes you can have a moving planet called a transit come through the bendings of your natal nodes. And they're going to help you shift that energy either more towards working on the south node or more towards working on the north node. Now one of the things the south node is said to represent is release. It's what we need to kind of let go of and move past. And the, south, uh, the north node is what we need to reach for and try to grasp. And it's possible you might have two things across from each other in your natal chart. They might form the cross with your node axis. So that would say whatever is that tension between your two planets has a very strong karmic component for you in your spiritual growth. And it can also happen that two planets will be moving through the zodiac together and come to that position where they make the cross with the nodes as well. And when it's something that's happening in the transits, it's things that can affect kind of anybody in the world because it's, you know, happening to all of us. Some people will feel it more strongly or it'll hit into their lifetime if it's touching something in their chart. Now I also want to mention how when we have this backwards movement of, it's the south node, the release point from Pisces into Aquarius, this is the shift over of signs that relate to what we call the great ages. And when we say we're leaving the age of Pisces and moving into the age of Aquarius, what we're talking about are some long-term, more than 2,000 year periods out of a 26,000 year cycle of these great ages or what we call the cosmic year. Uh, there might be another term for it that is escaping me right now. So we say that the age of Pisces began around the time of Christ. And actually the Christ kind of energy is very associated with what the traits of Pisces are, which are kind of um, unconditional love, love your enemy as yourself, and 
um, turn the other cheek, things like that. The golden rule, treat other people as you would like to be treated. Now, when we say this was the south node, we shouldn't be throwing that out, but maybe we were learning to be in some way judicious with it because of the Virgo side, kind of saying, well, how can we take this unconditional love and put it to use, put it into service in some way? Would have been a good thing to learn. I'm not sure we all learned that in the last 18 months. But anyway, um, this great age of Pisces, it's the time of belief systems and faith, you know, taking things on faith. And we had the religions that would kind of tell us, well, what should we believe? The opposite to that of Virgo is the skepticism. But when we move from Pisces back into Aquarius, Aquarius is very science-based. It's ruled by Uranus, which is the planet of uh, kind of engineering and technology and the space age planet. It rules flight, whether plane or, you know, rocket. Um, and it's the sign of everybody. So instead of having one avatar, one Christ, we have the multiple, the Christ in all of us. And that's what some people think the second coming is like, you know, Jesus is coming again. I interpret it as the Christ principle comes into everyone, so we are all gods and goddesses. Well, when does that really get going? Some people say it started around uh, the time we put a man on the moon. And that's the same time around which we had that um, song from the musical hair, it is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. So, you know, nowadays in 2000 something, you talk to people and they think, oh, age of Aquarius, that was just hippies in the 60s and 70s. No, we haven't really hardly started. Something like this nodal shift is part of the changeover. I think when we have slow Jupiter Saturn that get together once every 20 years and they do that in 2021 in Aquarius, to me, that's my marker of the beginning of the new age. But we may get a little preview of coming attractions of what that kind of consciousness should be about when we see the time frame of this node moving through that final degree of Aquarius to the Pisces cusp. And that is going to take place from April 28th, like I said, when the node north node enters Leo, the south node enters Aquarius, and it's in that zero or I mean that 30 degree, the final degree, until May 17th. So what I want you to keep your eyes open for as we go from late April into most of May, are you seeing any signs of what you think the new age coming is? Or what do you need to do to prepare now that you know a little bit more about your celestial directional indicators and finding your shine and being supported by your peeps to do your creative thing. So, had a little fun talking to you with my props today. I hope you like that, Donna. And we'll be back again next month to talk about more astrology on Looking Up. Mm -hmm.